We're gonna try a little nighttime crappie fishing. So today we are on a bluegill mission. Last night, we had the pleasure of sleeping out of the Yeti. Now that it's daytime, we're gonna go out and hunt. We're gonna drill a lot of holes and hopefully catch some bluegills. Oop, there's another one right there. What's that about? Yeah, there's fish, that's good. That is a beautiful, beautiful gill right there. Another solid gill. That's why you make trips like these, is for donkey bluegills like that. That's a nice crappie, exactly what we came for. Look at that. That is what we came for. Nice crappie. Look at that crappie. That's what we came out here for. Big gills, big crappies, playing on the basin. That's a beautiful fish. Ain't that fun. Ain't that fun. Welcome back to Angling Buzz Ice. To kick off this new season, this episode is going to be all about panfish. Here, this is like about a nine and a half, you know, inch bull bluegill. These are the fish that you want to release. You want to release the males, believe it or not. We're going to be joined by some of the best anglers across the Midwest. You know, guys like Matt Johnson. So many times these anglers sit on these pods of fish and they wait for prime time, twilight, window bite, sun up, sun down. I'm not that guy. I'm combat fishing throughout the day. Tony Roach. If you can get them keying in on that treble hook, you're going to put more fish topside. Joel Nelson. Think about rod length as a function of the way you're fishing. And Jared Houston. Right now with this early ice bite that we got going on, it's more productive to be right here doing this right, right now. Now while I load up the Yeti for this upcoming ice season, let's join James Linder and his buddy Panfish Phil as they show you how they find crappies in shallow and deep basins. We're on a midwinter panfish hunt. I'm with my buddy here, Phil Lobby, also known as Panfish Phil. The interesting thing is, you know, on any good, really good panfish lake, you know, not all the fish are always doing the same thing at the same time. In many lakes, the fish are in varied habitats, dependent on where the food is at. Yeah, there's some basin fish out there as we started to look around, and it was a mix of both crappies and bluegill. The fish are sort of moving around constantly, and so what we're going to do is put 360 down, take a little bit of scan around, and see if we can see some schools of fish. Yep, let's go. Okay. Let's do her. We got some suspended fish right underneath us right here. This is the surface, this is the bottom, but in between us and the bottom, you have this school of fish right here. One thing for this deep water fishing like this, you know, when these fish are off in these, these soft bottom basin areas, this unit here is just amazing to uh, find them because these fish are sort of roving around out here. You know, you can, you can even see right here, these fish are changing their position right here. We have a number of suspended probably, uh, I don't know, but between uh, three and five feet off the bottom. Those are probably crappies, like what you're saying, that uh, the individual fish act differently. Bluegills have the tendency to be really pinned down tight to the bottom where the crappies will suspend up a little bit. And then you can see fish off, actually off on the soft bottom out here. You can see these crappies out in the mud out in here. And these schools are constantly moving around, but electronics like this, you can see there's more fish out here too. These white grains of rice, so those are fish, as you see it, sweeping around, you'll see those fish actually changing position because the fish are moving. You can see all of a sudden there, there's, a whole, there's a whole bunch of them out that way. And we just left Jimmy out in the deep stuff and we decided to move up shallow to chase these shallow crappies and bluegills. And what we're on is a little bit of a shallow basin. If you think about the deep basins, they're 28 feet. Everyone thinks about a deep basin, but there's actually these shallow basins that are 12 to 15 feet. 
So in this surrounding area, it's 12 to 15 feet in the middle and on the surrounding edges, we've got some weeds and what we're gonna do is just try and jump around. I don't have the 360 electronics, so we're gonna go a little bit more old school, which I like to do, it's a lot of fun. It's just grab the camera, we're gonna drill holes and look with the camera and see what we can find and if we find them, we're gonna just start fishing them. So we're gonna move around on this flat a little bit and um, do a little search and destroy. I like to use this big camera when I'm jumping around, but when I find the fish and I kind of want to get a little more detailed on what's going on around me, I will jump to the little micro. There they are. Nice. Just found them. Well, I tell you, there's there, part of this hunt is pretty exciting. I mean, the catching is a lot of fun, but I tell you what, parts of me likes the adventure, likes the uh, actual hunt just as much as the catch. Now, if you enjoyed that, you can check out the extended version in the coming weeks on our YouTube channel. Make sure to like and subscribe. Now, this next segment is about a piece of equipment that's great for early ice or in a Yeti fish house, and that's the Strike Master 24 volt. Let's learn a little bit more about it. Now new to the Strike Master lineup is the 24 volt lithium auger. Now this thing is awesome. It, it's incredibly light, you know, I can lift up with two fingers. It's under 15 pounds. It's super compact. If you're an angler that likes to fish in a wheelhouse or you know, you maybe have a fish house but you only move to a couple spots during the day, this is the auger for you. You'll get about 50 holes early ice, about 30 holes late ice. And it's just incredibly light, it's incredibly compact, so you know, you get a mount, it takes up little space on the wall or in a fish house, and it just shreds through the ice. Check this out. Now that we punched through the ice, a great feature on all the Strike Master electric lineup, including the 24 volt, is the reverse feature. So I just click over reverse and I can shoot the slush right down the hole. Now, if you're looking for an auger for your wheelhouse, the Strike Master 24 volt is one of the best options out there. Next, let's join Joel Nelson as he shares his run and gun technique for crappies and a couple of presentations he likes to use when being mobile. <laughs> Now that's a run and gun crappie. I tell you what, we've been punching holes all over the place around us. And when I have to be mobile, I have to have my rods and my baits set up the way I need them to, because I don't want to be fumbling through all my tackle to retie different hooks on. And I keep a pretty simple strategy. It's really a one, two punch. And that is first and foremost with a jigging spoon. Now I really like this bro bug spoon. It fishes fast. That's really what it's all about. It's got some great color sets to it. I like that as well. And I'm able to hole hop, run and gun, get this bait in front of a lot of fish. And really what I'm looking for, I'm looking to take their temperature. I'm seeing what they're doing on the graph and seeing how they respond to this really aggressive, fast fishing bait. If I'm catching crappies this way, hey, I'm great with that. That's the way I want to be doing it all day because I won't have to bait up as much. Fish are gonna be aggressive. They're rushing up to the bait. It's a dream scenario. But what happens when you don't have that? So often, you're hole hopping, you see a fish, you drop the spoon down to them. They don't like it. They shun it, they either don't come up to it or they come up to it and they say, no way. Well, that is when I've got a secondary presentation ready to go, rigged, and it's very simple. It's just a small tungsten, a micro tungsten, tipped with a little bit of wax worm or a little bit of maggot, it's super simple. But it's at the other end of the spectrum, right? This is much less aggressive. This is much more finesse. This one's all about enticing them to bite once you already have them inside the cone angle. So then I see how they react to this bait. If they very slowly come up and just nip it, I know it's probably gonna be a slower day. It's probably gonna be finesse. I'll probably go back to my rod box dig out a couple different looks, maybe a vertical presentation that's also finesse. I might mess with plastics, but within two different drops of two different baits, a couple different schools of crappies really reveal their attitude for the day, and it helps set me up for everything I need. Again, when I'm hole hopping, 
I don't want to carry all my tackle with me. I don't want to carry all my rods with me. I stick to two presentations. That's fishing fast, proud and loud with a spoon presentation, and then going to something micro as a follow-up to see if that'll seal the deal. Thanks, Joel. Now let's join Jared Houston and hear his theory on whether you should be mobile or stationary when targeting panfish. That is a money maker. We're being pretty stationary here. We're kind of letting fish come to us. What a bruiser. It's always a, a dilemma for an angler. Is do you walk around and hole hop or do you sit stationary and wait for fish to go by? Well, it depends on the circumstance in my opinion and my experience fish in this early water shallow bite. I, I think that if you're walking around, you're kind of spooking fish and pushing them around. So I kind of like to just be a little stationary. Um, so what I got going on here is a couple of live rods. We are using multiple, uh, two, two rods per person out in the Minnesota waters here. And um, I got my little jig in tungsten and just real nearby is my dead stick, which only consists of a very limber tip. So I can watch my minnow do its dance. And I got a live minnow, like I mentioned. It's just a little demon spoon on there. If I see a fish on my graph here, chances are if it's not gonna bite here, there's a good chance it's gonna go take a look here. So that's my productive way to be on the stationary bite. Now if I'm hole hopping, I'm kind of chasing fish around. And there is a time and place to do that as well. But right now with this early ice bite that we got going on, it's not now. It's more productive to be right here, doing this right, right now. Now let's join Tony Roach as he shares his top three presentations for panfish. Hey, I'm Tony Roach. When it comes to chasing panfish all winter, there's really three go-to presentations that I use in almost all scenarios. You know, all lakes are not created equal. All these panfish are not always in the same locations. And so I'll show you kind of the insight in what I do to chase these fish and to really capitalize on these fish. So really my three go-tos are a horizontal type of presentation, whether it's a jigging wrap, rip and wrap, slab wrap, a spoon, and then of course a small tungsten either with plastic or live bait. Now, don't be afraid on your horizontal baits or your larger spoons to tip that with either live bait or a piece of plastic. Panfish sometimes are inefficient feeders and they'll hit the front end of that bait. So if you can get them keying in on that treble hook, you're gonna put more fish topside. Thanks, Tony. Now let's join up again with Joel Nelson and hear his theory on rod length. You know, there's a couple different ways to catch panfish when we're talking about rods and rod lengths. And I wanna to focus today on rod length as a function of form, not just personal preference. You know, I've got a bunch of rods out in front of me and so many people think of all these different panfish rods and their lengths as something that, you know, I'd fish it if I prefer that length. No, no, no. Think about rod length as a function of the way you're fishing. So. I was using this pan dancer right here. It's, it's a very long rod by a lot of standards. It's a 32 inch long panfish rod, which I really prefer when I'm out hole hopping, popping around. Now, long is really nice because you don't have to necessarily kneel down to the ice, but sometimes long can mean a 28 inch St. Croix CCI tungsten tamer as well. I really prefer lengths like this one in the 28 inch range. When I got a little wind coming up behind me, and that way I can kind of hide the rod tip, still be able to see and feel and detect the bite without missing any fish because the wind is blowing against the blank. So those are the two long setups in my operation. I love it to stay mobile and to hole hop. But what happens when the fish are really finicky, when it requires kind of a finesse kind of bite? Well, that's when a shorter rod, a 24 inch pan finesse, let's say, is definitely the call of the day because a little bit shorter stick allows you precision jig placement, total control of the bait, being able to constantly monitor exactly what's going on. If you've got a plastic on there, it imparts incredible action. If you're fishing live bait, it keeps everything looking lifelike. So really, I prefer something in the 24 inch range when the bite's tough and I feel like I really need to precision place the bait. Now, what about the really, really short rod? Something like this little stick right here is just a 20 inch sight bite rod. And people wonder, why would you ever want a rod that short? Well, again, it's all about the functionality. Let's say I'm sight fishing. 
I would be leaning over the hole and I'd probably be like this. And the hook set would, up, would just literally be the flick of a wrist. So something that's extremely short is actually gonna ride up by my ear. That's why you run a really short rod when you're sight fishing. It has nothing to do with anything else other than fishing the right length for the job at hand. And that's what we've got. We've got long rods to run around the open ice, catch fish, stand up, you know, be aggressive on the bite. We've got slightly shorter sticks in the 24 inch range to be able to tie everything together from a finesse standpoint. And when you're sight fishing, choose something a lot shorter. So there you have it. Rod length for panfish, not as a function of what you prefer, but more as a function of what presents the baits best. It's time for this show's cool products brought to you by Fleet Farm. To start it off, we've got the Blackfish Storm Skin Suit. It's a soft shell fabric suit. Uh, it's windproof and waterproof. It's got waterproof zippers. It's got a fleece lining for maximum comfort and breathability. It's kind of an overall, you know, early season, um, late season kind of suit for fair temperatures. Now on the topic of staying warm, you gotta remember your hands and feet. So let's start with these Merino wool socks brought to you by Clam. These are naturally moisture wicking. They're gonna keep your feet nice and dry and keep you warm throughout the winter. Now when it comes to your hands, here's the Delta Mitt by Clam. Now this is 100% waterproof. It's got 200 grams of Thinsulate. You know, it's gonna keep your hands nice and warm and when it comes to keeping your hands warm, there's nothing better than a mitt. Now moving on to electronics, we're gonna start off with the Aquaview Micro Revolution 5.0 Pro. Now this has got a five inch high resolution LCD screen. It's got a super efficient cable management system. It's got recording capabilities, and this is just a great tool for open water and on the ice. If you're gonna be doing a lot of recon, this is a must have. Next up is the Hummingbird Helix 7 with Chirpin GPS Gen 4 and the new Hummingbird Helix Ice Shuttle. This new ice shuttle comes with rod holders. It comes with a quarter 20 mount so you can mount GoPros and other accessories on it. The real great thing about this is it's all lithium powered. So it's lightweight, durable, and tough, and it's gonna handle a bunch of hole hopping and fishing this winter. Now I know we talked about it earlier in the show, but I wanna talk about it again because this thing is awesome. And it's the Strike Master Lithium 24 volt. Now this auger is lightweight, it's under 15 pounds. This thing shreds the ice. With a six inch bit and 16 inches of ice, you're gonna get 65 holes. With an eight inch bit, you're gonna get 50 holes. I mean, if you're a guy who fishes in the ice house or likes to hole hop around, this is the auger for you. Now, moving on to baits, let's talk about one of my personal favorite panfish baits, and that's this jig trailer, the Silky, made by Clam. Now this thing is awesome. It can be fished without live bait or paired with live bait. It absorbs water, so it gives it like a really unique action unlike any other artificial. Um, it almost fishes like a hair and plastic combined, and fish just love it. Now moving on to jigs, here we've got the VMC Tungsten Mongo Jig. And new this year, they've got six different colors. You know, they've got really, you know, bright UV colors and they've got some natural colors. Um, what I love about the Mongo Jig is it's got a real stout hook, so it really helps with some of those bigger fish. And it comes in two different sizes, a 1 16th ounce and a 1 32nd ounce. Overall, it's just a great panfish jig. Now, new this year to Northland is the Buckshot Coffin Spoon. Now this is a great spoon if you're looking to target, you know, big crappies. I love their 1 8 ounce, but they also have sizes that get up to, you know, 3 8 1 4 ounce if you're looking to target walleyes. Now this spoon's kind of a hybrid between their Macho Minnow and their Buckshot Spoon. It gives off a ton of flash and has a bunch of different colors that really call in fish. Alright, also new to Northland this year is the Bro Bug Spoon. Now this spoon comes in three different sizes, from a 1 16 ounce here all the way up to a quarter ounce. It comes in 12 different colors. I really like the 16th ounce for, you know, big crappies, big bluegills. You pair it with a waxy, this thing works great. But you can also fish it straight and catch a lot of fish. Now as you size up here to the 8th ounce or the quarter ounce, they work great for walleyes or other fish that are keen in on bugs. Bottom line, are these are some spoons that you gotta have this winter. Now moving on from baits. Over the past couple days, we've been setting up our Yeti fish house, getting ready for this upcoming winter. And one thing we've been installing all over the place are these catch cover quick disc systems. Now they come with different accessories like rod holders, cup holders, and rattle reels. They're super easy to install and it really helps you customize your ice house. Now moving on to another ice house accessory. 
Here I've got the rattle reel with the smart hub made by Rapala. Now this comes pre-spooled with 25 yards of 30 pound suffix rattle reel line. Now the really unique thing about this is it's compatible with all suffix and rattle reel tip up line spools. So you know you have four different colors and 20 pound or 30 pound options of suffix rattle reel line. Say I wanted to switch on the high vis here, I just unscrew this, drop the new spool in and you're good to go. Now, moving on from rattle reels, it's time to talk about actual rod and reels. And here I've got Tuned Up Customs Precision Noodle. Now this is their 32 inch, but they come in 28 inches all the way up to 36 inches. Comes standard with recoil guides. It's got the green highlighted tip, and you can actually get this rod customized if you'd like. Now this rod's designed for those super, you know, finesse presentations, you know, your 164th ounce, really light jigs. It's just an overall great panfish rod. New to St. Croix this year is their Tundra Series Ice Rods. They come in sizes from 26 inches up to 36 inches, from light to medium heavy. This one happens to be their 26 inch rod, light, extra fast action. This is a great panfish rod, you know, you get those recoil guides in case you get ice on there. It's got the highlighted orange tip for detecting those light bites, and you get a custom rod feel for a reasonable price. Now moving on to reels, here's a reel you could pair with either of these rods, and it's the Daiwa Laguna 1000 LT. Now this thing is awesome. It's super compact, it's super tough, it's under eight ounces, so it balances really well with any panfish rod you pair it with. Now that wraps up cool products. Now make sure to head to your local fleet farm where you can find a bunch of this awesome gear. So far this episode's been all about panfish, but let's switch gears quick and talk about some fish that fight just a little bit harder. Right now is the perfect time to be planning any trips for this upcoming ice season. So let's join Nick Linder and Brett McComas as they travel to Manitoba in search of some multi-species action. Today I am out on Lake Winnipeg, home of the famous greenback walleyes of Manitoba. It was a nice balmy negative 20 as we were driving in and it sounds like it's not going to get a whole lot warmer than that today. So we are going to be shacking up and uh, jigging. We got some dead sticks and we got some big spoons, big lipless crankbaits, and we are going to try and stay warm in the freezing, freezing tundra of Big Windy. So this is the first thing on this trip that has actually made me feel at home. We're setting up dead sticks, something we do all the time back in the States. This is barbless in Manitoba, so we're putting a little stopper on here so you can't swim off and Todd recommended something with a little flash. So we are all rigged up, put about a foot off the bottom. Hopefully we will draw them in with the rattles and seal the deal with the, with the uh, dead stick. When he yes, is right on the button. Right on the button. Oh, yep. Look at that bottom part there. That is a master angler greenback walleye, guys, right there. Awesome and fish. Check it out. The shoulders on that fish is insane. All right, so now that we're all hooked up with the cold temperatures outside, Brett is doing something a little special, warming up some salties. So we can't chum in Minnesota, but you can here in Manitoba. Oh, you can probably smell that through the camera. Soupier the better, stinkier the better. Melting them down a little bit over the heater to get that kind of sludge, mushy sludge in there. I'm gonna mash them up with the ice scoop and throw down a handful. See if we can't bring some fish to us while it's negative 24 degrees. It's actually hot. It's so awkward. <laughs> Let's keep that away from my camera. Got something on your lens. <laughs> <laughs> we'll do some hole hopping later once it warms up to like negative 10. <laughs> As long as that head can come in. Hold on here, let me, is the head in bro? That's a good okay. one. Yeah, the head's in. Oh yeah, that's it. Oh. Big one! Oh my word! Big one! Yeah buddy! Yeah buddy! It demolished it boys. That is insane. Just dropped it down. Fat rattle bait. Oh. Look at that. Ooh, I just drilled that hole too, gentlemen. Look at how big it is. That's gotta be like the biggest wall I've ever seen. Look at that. So here's a question for you. How in the world can the second largest lake in Manitoba fly under the radar? Right now, we are out on Lake Manitoba. 
which is a huge lake with excellent walleye fishing. God, these things are so healthy. He's <laughs> waving goodbye. We'll just keep rolling with it. Yeah. <laughs> Love it, dude. As you can see behind me here, you can't see the shoreline. This is a huge lake. She's a beauty, eh? According to our guide, Chris Torney. It works, so. <laughs> according, according to Chris, right now, the population on Lake Manitoba is on the rise. Wait, wait, look at the back. How thick that is. And the fish are super duper chunky. And hey, they eat rattle baits here too. Spoiler alert. <laughs> that was madness. It was madness. Awesome madness, but it was it was madness. Also another interesting thing about this lake is he says that he never catches walleyes deeper than 10 feet of water. What are we in right now, Brad? Anything from six to seven feet, which is uh, definitely a little different than uh, back home. To be fishing in six feet, and if you do too big of a rip, you can feel your bait hit the bottom of the ice. <laughs> but it's uh, it's insane. Oh, oh, oh! No way! Yes! Check out this chunker! Holy cow! Sweet! So right now we are up in. Winnipeg and we are heading up to Wakusco Falls Lodge in northern Manitoba. So one of the really awesome things about Manitoba fishery is the ease of access. You know, there's two main highways coming up and all along that highway there's fishing opportunities that would just blow your mind whether it's catfish to greenbacks, crappie, you know coming up north we're getting into the golden walleye, pike everywhere you go giant lake trout. You know, we have a ton of awesome drive-to fisheries, whether the northern region, central, south, west, east. Today out here, you know, we're in a backcountry lake in the middle of nowhere. And, you know, a lot of people have the perception when you come to northern Manitoba or to these lakes that aren't pressured much, that you're just gonna get out here and just clobber the fish. And you can basically throw down anything in your tackle box and you're gonna hook up. Yes. No. Awesome. <laughs> On a spinner bait. I know there's some days where that's going to be true, but a lot of the time you're still going to have to fish the fish. It's no different on any other body of water that the fish, if they're neutral or negative, you're going to have to work at it. You're going to have to drill holes, you're going to have to use your electronics, and you're going to have to use whatever fishing knowledge you have to potentially connect. But those that are willing to do it, willing to be mobile, willing to put the time and effort into it, and not give up, those are usually the people that come up here that tag into the biggest fish and the most fish. Man, Manitoba's an awesome place. But let's get back on the panfish theme and join Matt Johnson as he shows you how to target pressured panfish in the Twin Cities. Where I spend a lot of time fishing in the Twin Cities area of Minnesota as a fishing guide, we deal with a lot of pressured fish, a lot of anglers out there, and these fish get finicky, whether it's bluegills, crappies, you name it. We gotta change our approach. We're dealing with pressured panfish, and there's a handful of approaches, and, and I'm a little unorthodox at times how I target these fish. A lot of anglers right off the bat are gonna think immediately, spring bobber, finesse jigs, and that's gonna happen. There's a place for that, but when I'm targeting pressured panfish in large areas where a lot of anglers like to congregate, I'm going a little bigger. I'm starting off with a 16th ounce spoon. I'm working aggressively. I'm trying to pick that bigger fish out of the school because so many times these anglers sit on these pods of fish and they wait for prime time, twilight, window bite, sun up, sun down. I'm not that guy. I'm combat fishing throughout the day. So I'll oftentimes go the opposite direction of many anglers, and I will chase them with a spoon or a larger plastic. Now, that's not always gonna work, don't get me wrong. If it doesn't work, you have to do the finesse game, and I'm hitting them with a two-prong approach. I'm fishing them with either plastics, because the nice thing about plastic is I'm the master of what this presentation does. I'm not worried about a minnow, I'm not worried about a maggot, I'm not worried about line twists. When you get good at fishing plastics, and artificial baits, you're the one in control. And having control when you're targeting finicky, pressured panfish is 
everything. Because when that big blue blue comes in and you got one shot at that fish, that spinning lure or that minnow that darts the wrong way, they don't bite it. So I can control fish when I'm targeting with plastic. So I'm using smaller jigs, generally a number 12, maybe a number 14, and I'm targeting them with smaller finesse plastics. And if that doesn't work, I go to a smaller, lightweight, vertical presentation that I can fish really slow, feather down the water column, and it gets these fish to go. Other tips you want to definitely consider, as I'm taking anglers fishing, oftentimes I see them fishing heavy pound test line. A lot of coil in it, six pound test line for bluegills and crappies. Six pound test line should not be in your vocabulary for bluegills and crappies, especially pressured fish. We're fishing three pound test line, two pound test line, fluorocarbon, and reels that allow you to have the line come off straight and no line twist. So these spooler type reels, line comes straight off, the jig goes straight down, I'm alleviating twist, I'm giving myself control, and it's forcing me to slow down. So when I'm targeting these fish right now, like in six, seven feet of water, a lot of guys wanna bomb them down with a, with a spinning reel. I'm feathering that thing down, I have to fish slow now, and I'm pulling line by hand, and I'm working that entire water column. That's something a lot of anglers don't do. They go right down to the bottom. I'm working that entire water column and I'm fishing slow. We oftentimes fish way too fast for pressured fish. So whether you're fishing bluegills, whether you're fishing crappies, use some of these tactics. Try throwing something big at them. Give them that one big meal and if it doesn't go, turn to plastics, turn to finesse approaches. Remember to slow down how you're fishing and it'll put more fish top stuff. Thanks, Matt. Those were some great tips. Now let's head over and join Jason Rylander and Ty Shadeen on why they prefer custom ice rods. There! That's what we're talking about, buddy! Oh my goodness. That's what gets you excited, huh? There he is. That's what we're talking about, doubling up on these big Jason crappies. Monster and fish. Nice crappie, buddy. You know, when you're talking about fishing for neutral, finicky panfish, like we're doing these custom rods that have, that have become ultra popular in the, in the industry right now. Well, absolutely. They're, first off, they're fun to fish with. They're a lot of fun to fish with. And two, when you've got a tough bite like we've got today, and these fish are hitting so light, you know, we're both playing with our bull whips right now, I'm tuned up, and you know, I've got that rod that I can, I'm watching that rod tip, whether it's going up or, or down or up. You just detect those finicky, really light bites with these small jigs. Yeah, right now I'm just, I'm watching my, my helix. When I see a mark comes up that I know is a, is a big sunfish or crappie, I actually, my rod is right in line with my view with my electronics, and I switch my view from the electronics to actually my rod tip, because you can, like you're saying, you can detect those up bites, the really sensitive, the yep. you can feel it. Absolutely. We would agree that with these, you can use ultra light lures with, at the end of your line. So you're talking about these tungsten baits, these small micro spoons like Northland's got. You can use those in these situations where the rod is so sensitive, you can even feel that, that little wave in the water when you're jigging like you are Absolutely. doing right now. Yeah, I'm using a 132nd ounce jig right now. It's crazy. And like you said, you're investing so much in augers and in electronics. A rod is probably the most important thing you're using. Why not make that investment and, and get a good rod? He came in hot. He came in hot. These rods help you put more fish on the ice. We're proving that today. Absolutely. Oh, nice crappie. Nice crappie. Look at that crappie. That's what we came out here for. Big gills, big crappies, playing on the basin. Ain't that fun. Ain't that fun. Just shy of 16. 16 and three quarters. That is, that's one of the biggest crappies I've ever caught. I've never been able to break 16. Maybe today's the day. That wraps up this episode of Angling Buzz Ice. Make sure to head to our website where you can sign up for our newsletter. We'll also be releasing new content each week on our social platforms. Thanks for watching, and we'll catch you guys on the ice. We're gonna get these things real hot and mushy. Nothing like <sighs> some uh, nice, toasty, warm salties in the hub shack to uh, make things smell extra, extra delicious in here. With a little chum. 
Ah, no. <laughs> yeah, I, I purposely threw a little short on that one. Screw that, man. I thought it went in your mouth. <laughs> <laughs>